Hi, and welcome back to our Rust, Orboot, and Risk v hacking streams. So today uh, we have some news up front again, and then we will get back to our Vision 5.1 board, which is now so far good to go. So first up, we have this year. Uh, this year in Rust, uh, in Embedded Rust 2021. So this is a post from last year, uh, where they posted about all the news in Embedded Rust. And the same thing is also going to happen again this year. Uh, so we have got an issue here on GitHub for the 2022 edition. And I just added a bunch of notes here a few weeks ago. Uh, just like further down, there is even more uh, from uh, all the people in the world who are working with or on uh, embedded trust things. And so, yeah, I hope um, that we will also get a bit of a shout out and also everything else. Uh, will be a very nice and interesting read for people interested in embedded development with Rust. So yeah, I will also um, post the link to this year in the notes later on. And so you can read up on this or uh, just uh, look for the post yourself now. Um, quite some interesting stuff going on each and every year. Uh, the next thing I want to briefly look at is the Vision 5.2 board that we had already mentioned. So now it looks like there is a bit more documentation to be found, uh, at least this year. Uh, it's a bit new to me currently. And what I would like to point out here is a few differences between this board and the board we're currently working with. So our board, uh, if you remember, has a special header, uh, which we're currently using for talking to the board and uh, actually putting something uh, in its SRAM. Uh, that would then be running uh, when we, uh, you know, use uh, the tool for it. And well, that header had been here. However, on this board, it seems like it's gone. And actually the orientation of the board is also a bit different. So the USB port that you see here, uh, that would be for powering the board um, on the Vision 5.1 board. Uh, well, it's actually down here. On, on this side. So yeah, instead we now have a second ethernet port here. So another difference you may spot is uh, there is only one DRAM part here. There might be another one at the bottom of the board, but the spy flash is not visible on this side. So yeah, instead though, uh, we have these switches here. You can configure those to select a boot source. So the boot source can be uh, either the spy flash on the board, I think, or an SD card, which I think would be inserted here. And then there is also the option to uh, boot over the UART again, just like what we're doing here. So using uh, the protocol that is coming from the mask room. And so let's scroll further down and see the bottom of the board. And here we are. So yeah, as you can see, there is no second DRAM part. So it's only uh, one. Um, it could be that there is a different variant of the board and this year is only one of them being shown. I'm not too sure about that yet. Uh, yeah, this year uh, is actually the SD card reader, so I was wrong. Uh, this year is not an SD card reader. Uh, it is something else. There's a lot of 16s here, so we can look further down what the description says. Now this year, number two, this is the main spy flash where the main firmware resides. And then there is a smaller one here, uh, which is actually for the USB controller. So the USB controller is this here. And that is uh, a very common one that you also find in uh, like um, lots of like USB adapters and stuff like that. I think uh, it's from VIA. So VIA is a vendor also known from the x86 world. And they make lots of things like chipsets and uh, USB adapters and things like that. Um, so yeah, let's uh, look quickly at this here, uh, not too extensively though. So the list here says, okay, so it's not like 16 is covering everything. I guess they just messed up the numbers here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this 16 here, this is the USB controller, right? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what they did there. So yeah, they're, they're listing everything here. 
and they are saying you would have either two, four, or eight gigabytes of SD RAM. It's LPDDR4, so it's the same uh, kind of RAM, the low power DRAM that we also have here on the Vision 5 One board. Uh, the reset button and the boot mode pin. So that's uh, the switches that I showed you. It's like really tiny switches. So you just move them up and down and depending on the switch position, uh, that is how you would determine the boot mode. Now, anything else interesting here? I don't think so currently. Um, yeah, there, there is still a lot of documentation missing currently. I hope that will follow at some point. But yeah, then again, I have not invested in this board uh, for uh, further developing Orboot, um, actually because of the lack of, of documentation, right? So yeah, I, I knew they didn't uh, have much here and I didn't really expect much to be honest. So yeah, instead, I, uh, as I told you before, I invested in those here. So I bought a bunch of M1S dock boards. Uh, these are coming from Cyped, uh, based on a chip from Buffalo Lab. And there are two ports on here, one for the UART and one is called OTG. And that will make uh, development for uh, this thing here much, much nicer again. So uh, Pine64, they have released a very similar board. Uh, they also have a bunch of uh, nodes already here in their wiki. So there is a lot of resources to look at here now. Uh, Buffalo Lab themselves, they have already pushed out also a bunch of documentation. Uh, quite some things are in Chinese, a bit of work in progress still. Uh, but then again, a bunch of people have already bought a bunch of boards because um, there are also other variants. There is this page here where somebody documented how the boot ROM works. Uh, there is this page here documenting the BL602 bootloader, which is uh, very much related and will be relevant to look at as well. Well, and uh, some people already try to get some Rust code running on it. Uh, this one here, uh, Wider Master, is also contributing to Orboot occasionally. Uh, also helped us out with a few things. And well, how would that work? Well, Buffalo Lab themselves actually published a pack, a peripheral access crate, uh, just like it's defined uh, from the Rust Embedded Working Group, which is really cool. So yeah, we will be able to work with this really nicely, I hope. Um, there is an SVD file here. So the SVD file is um, what the uh, actual uh, crate would be generated from. So there is a tool in Rust that we can use. We already have this file here, device.x. So this will uh, provide everything that is necessary for the linker to work. So if we look, at, oh, that looks still a bit empty. Huh, okay. I hope that will be filled up then for the linker. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, it might also that this here is actually just an empty file because this is like, um, it could be that the final build artifact uh, will then be a bit different. We'll have to see a bit. Uh, yeah, but as you can see, there is a lot of stuff in here. I hope it's not all empty files, just like what we saw before. But this here looks actually quite filled up already. I'm just randomly cl uh, clicking it on some things here. Yeah, so these are definitely filled. Um, so it will hopefully be a very nice development target. Well, and they also published Linux sources already. So if we uh, want to test something uh, on this board, so like if we have everything running so far, uh, we can also uh, take this here. I think this is patches for Linux 5.10 kernel. Um, yeah, that will be good enough for just testing our code. And they also provided an open SBI implementation here uh, that we can maybe also look at for some changes we might have to do. So yeah, uh, all that said, uh, let us come back to our development here for the Vision 5.1. And I have some very good news. So uh, last time we were still having some trouble and in investigating the uh, DRAM initialization. So there was something wonky still and we had that issue where if we loaded something to the cacheable DRAM, and that is where um, the uh, vendor provided uh, code, which is uh, for U-boot, would be expecting to uh, would be expecting to run from. Um, that that didn't really work. So we were suddenly losing data for some reason. We were not sure why. So yeah, it turns out there is uh, something um, that still had to be implemented, which I completely overlooked. So 
and the vendor C implementation. That was one big function for the DRAM initialization. And after that, outside of that function, there was still uh, another call to another small function, which was uh, setting up some register. So yeah, we will have a look at that. Um, first up, let me quickly run this here so that we can see that everything is working nicely now. So I'm saying make run again, just as usual, uh, pressing the buttons for now loading uh, our build artifact into SRAM. And so that will then be running. It will print some output. It will uh, set up some uh, peripherals, like some clocks and the GPIO pins. Uh, and then we will see a bit of output, like, hey, this is Orbit. And eventually we will see the DRAM initialization. And when that is done, it will load and jump to the next stage, which is the final stage in this case now. And uh, yeah, let's actually let's actually see what happens. So yeah, this is now the DRAM test running. Now, whoops, that was so fast. Uh, I will just scroll up again. So here, after the DRAM test was done, we may actually uh, just strip down the test a bit so that it's uh, faster. Now there is a, a tiny check again, and that is after that uh, function that I just mentioned is being uh, called. Now it says copy payload. Uh, well, that actually went very, very quick. And then it says run payload. And that payload that is now coming from the spy flash, this is where uh, we still have the vendor provided open SBI implementation and then uBoot. So yeah, that, there is like one blob, which is uh, open SBI and uh, uBoot one after another. Um, it might be that Ubud is actually calling into this and then continuing with the rest or something. It doesn't really matter too much right now. Let's just scroll down again. So open SBI is again just like uh, what we saw initially when we got started working on the board. It's printing a bunch of information um, like on our console device, firmware base. So this is where we loaded that blob. Um, then some protections it's setting up. So this here is I think this should be like uh, the um, the PMP area. So PMP, uh, the protected memory something, uh, physical memory protection, right? So that, that's a risk five thing. It just means that those areas cannot be accessed by uh, other code running later uh, when it drops to supervisor mode. So yeah, if you were trying from your operating system to access something in this range here, let's say uh, the byte residing at that address, that should actually fail. So only everything after that would be uh, read writable for you. So yeah, now we see uBoot in the next step down here. So yeah, this is uh, still what, uh, you know, what's residing on the board. It's printing the CPU model. Uh, the, the CPU and the model is like the board um, and or, or yeah, that is actually the board, right? Uh, the amount of DRAM, so that's the eight gigabytes that we have. And then further down, it's now starting to load something else again. So we already had this set up where it would be loading Linux from TFTP. Uh, so this here is uh, loaded from another tool that we're using, it's called Sender, uh, coming from the Harvey operating system. And what it does is it's serving, first of all, DHCP. So this is how this year uh, could get its address configured. Uh, that is uh, here. And then it's fetching uh, our image. Yeah, just ignore this part. Uh, that is sort of my mistake. Um, and yeah, then, then it's loading here and I just uh, stopped at that point. Uh, but it's really just the output here that stopped. We can now see how it continued. So after a bunch of hashes, you would see Linux up and running. And here we are, and I just continued the output. Let's scroll up again to see what actually happened there. So yeah, the, there is a quite a quite a bunch of stuff that Linux is printing. So yeah, this is how loading finished. It was 23 megabytes in size, so that is quite some stuff, but yeah, okay, uh, granted for now. Um, when we put this here now in spy flash at some point uh, will actually be significantly less so we will do some compression and stuff and then we'll go down to like 10 megabytes ish we will have to see a bit we could also go 
quite some uh, amount down again, but yeah, we, we will have to see. It's not too important right now. So yeah, this here is now still from Uboot and it's now going to run Linux. So just like what we're uh, doing, it's loading uh, the kernel to somewhere in DRAM, uh, just like other stuff like the device tree here and also uh, the RAM disk. So RAM disk is where uh, we have our uroot that is uh, our file system that we're using initially for Linux. And then we already see the kernel starting up. And lo and behold, scrolling further down, here we are running Linux. And since we are now running the CPU daemon, um, I, I think we're already past that. So yeah, the banner is being printed here. Well, uh, was um, disturbed a bit, but this here is the CPU banner that we're seeing. Um, that means we can now connect to the board using CPU and we can run a command on it, like the CPU info command, uh, like the cat command, for example, to print out the CPU information. And now we see, well, processor and hard zero. Um, it looks like there is only a single hard available currently. Well, it should be because um, with the current code uh, that I wrote, uh, there is only one heart that is currently actually running. The other one is just spinning around infinitely. And uh, yeah, that would be something for the next step. So instead of keeping that spinning forever, uh, it should actually also jump to, well, uh, our payload again and then continue with the rest of the execution. So yeah, now with all that said, let's have a look actually at the code that I was missing here. And it's really just this one stupid line down here. And uh, what does it even do? So the function is called disable u74 mem axi remap. I'm not too certain what it's supposed to mean. So I really just, you know, took it from the C implementation again. Uh, we, we don't have too much documentation on this. Maybe we can find something in Sci-Fi's manual, so that would be interesting. Um, if, if we look at this, like how the function is actually defined, it's this here. So it's really just writing some value to some register again. And this here specifically is really just setting the last bit. So yeah, it's the last bit in this register that is uh, hex 110 off from the system control base address, which is 1185.0. Well, that was already all the magic that was missing. And now regarding the second heart that is still spinning, uh, just ignore that up there. <laughs> also still things I need to set up. So what is currently happening is um, this year. So the first heart would be just following uh, from like from here to down here and then jump to our main function. How that works is we're looking at the heart ID. So we're loading the heart ID in this register and then we're checking if it's actually zero. So we loaded the value zero in uh, the register A1. And now we're saying if it's not the zero heart, then we would jump down to non-boot heart. And that is the label down here and well, this is where, uh, you know, we would just be waiting for an interrupt. And if we get one, you know, we would just be uh, fancy spinning here. Now, technically what we could just do is, um, we, we could just ignore the specifics of any interrupt because we only expect one specific interrupt to happen. And uh, we, we could just jump to another address again. Uh, and that would be, the address where we loaded our payload. So how do we do that? Um, I hope we can just say jump to address somehow. So let's see, well, when we say jump here, right, then we would actually use a label and that label would, would be coming here uh, from our own definitions. Now, can we just say jump and then give it an address. Would that work? 
otherwise we will have to see a bit um I'm not too familiar with all the RIST-5 instructions, to be honest. So we will have to check. Uh, yeah, this here is what, what I'm doing for debugging. So technically, uh, if, if we now release this hard, it would continue executing here. And it would just be printing CCCCCCC to the serial. Of course, we don't really want that to happen, right? So <laughs> we'll need to do something else here. Um, so instead of J0B, let's actually see uh, if we can do something like J and then something like um, payload adder, let's say payload adder, and now we would need to supply the payload address saying payload adder equals, well, What is payload base? Let's search for it. Payload base is by flash. But okay, this is where we're loading it from. Um, but we would need to tell it to jump where we load it to. So that is happening much, much further down. So let's just put that somewhere else now. That would be the load address here. So all of this stuff we use for debugging uh, and loading and so on. We can actually put that further up now and let's do so. Let's put it up here like this. And then we will say uh, payload adder equals load adder. Or we may just say load adder equals load adder. Make it a bit shorter. All right. Now it says expected one of const in Okay. Huh. Interesting. It seems a bit unhappy. Oh. We would have to say const like this. Okay, that works. Mm -hmm. And well, we could even sort it a bit like like this. Okay, now the question is, does that even does that even compile? So when we just say make, does it give us any errors? It does. So yeah, I guess uh, that is not how it works. Immediate must be a multiple of two bytes. And this, oh, I see. So yeah, that wouldn't work. Um, so let's let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, so risk five jump instructions or jump instruction. Well, we end up here with uh, the risk five manual again. So where would we find the jump instruction? Well, there is base integer instruction set could be in here. Uh, it doesn't really sound like an integer instruction, to be honest, but then again, I'm not sure where we should find this. So usually the base integer instruction set is like the whole base for everything from what I understand so far. So let's see what we have here. So we have like add, um, subtract, I guess, S, L, L, whatever, I, SRL, SRAI. Oh, this is actually shift instructions. Okay. So here we can shift, LUI, AUIPC, integer register, register operations. Uh huh. Load and store operations. Okay. System instructions. Huh. Okay. So let's just search for jump. Do we find jump somewhere? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, look at this. So there is jump and there is jump and link. And jump expects an offset. Um, that is, that is a problem because we don't really know our offset. 
So how would we jump? Huh. Okay. Um we would need a declaration. We would need a declaration uh, for a function that is coming from C. And we would need to be able to tell uh, where that function is in memory. Now the question is, how do you do that? So you can say like, uh, pub extern C something. But how do you provide the memory address? If we can, if we can figure that out, then everything is fine. So we do provide a linker script, right? Or do we? So when we say build.rs, we're doing this here. So we have, let's put DRAM here. And the DRAM origin is, well, eight, oh, whatever. And the length would be, I'm not sure if uh, this can be lower and uppercase or whatever. So we can just say 8G. And now we should be able to declare a section somehow. And we should be able to say something like uh, offset here, offset there. And we should be able to somehow tell that the payload is now somewhere in memory, and then we can use it for jumping. Mm. Huh. And I hope that wouldn't be too far, actually. But then again, um, it works with this here, right? Oh, another thing we can do is, okay, we, we can do something that is much, much simpler. So, I mean, we, we already have something like this. Uh, let's forget about the issue here. Uh, instead, let's look at what we do here in our main function. So the last thing we do here is we do this transmute and so on. And then we say F. And we can do this very same stuff here in some function again. And let's just say uh, we call this function fn um, main other heart. Now this here can be dropped. We don't really need it. Uh, we would need to mark the whole thing as unsafe. Unsafe. Like this. Um, can forget about that part. I guess the fence is not too horrible. And all right, we would need to supply the heart ID. And how do we get the heart ID up here? Um, well, we're just reading the heart ID using the risk five heart ID register. So we can also put that here. Now we have the heart ID. The load address is the same, but we don't want to print it again here. Um, we just jump to our, let's say, payload. And now here, we'll say load 
Okay, let's call it main other. Let's say main other equals sim main other hard. And now here we also say call and we say call main other. Like this. Yeah. So before that, we should even see a C character. Uh, we can check if that really happens. Now, one thing we still need to do is down here, let's actually move that thing away. Um, we need to restore the heart. And how do we do that? We just write to the Clint. So the Clint is like the core local interrupt something. Um, we, we just write the value one and that should release the heart from spinning. Uh, it should trigger a, an interrupt and then we'll just continue executing. And let's see if that actually works. So yeah, here on the right, I'm just, whoopsie, just clearing this. And then we're going to run again. Oh, whoa. Okay, so apparently this is not how it works here with the, uh, let's actually just comment that out. So instead of having this whatever stuff in the linker script, uh, we're doing something else anyway. So let's just say, uh, I think hashes were comments in here. So we'll see. Yeah, it seems to be fine. All right. So yeah, pressing buttons again and it's loading again. If that works, we should then see two hearts appearing in Linux, I hope. And well, to check if that actually worked, we should also see uh, our C character being printed. And I guess that would appear right before Linux or right before, well, right before, uh, right before you would actually, right? Or even before open SVI what we get. DRAM check, loading, and here we go. Let's see if we got a C character somewhere. Do we see a C character? We don't. Well, let's wait for Linux to come up and then see what Linux says. If that doesn't work, we might need to do something else actually. All right, here is Linux, booting up, bring, oh, it said something like bringing up secondary CPUs. Did I read that correctly? Huh. SMP, bringing up secondary CPU. CPU one, failed to come online. Oh well. <laughs> so I guess it was still waiting for the interrupt. Let's see if we forgot something. Oh. Huh. Maybe it's getting lost in the interrupt handler or something. That could also be. So we do have an interrupt handler um, of sorts. This year, that is our trap handler. And we can actually check if we got something at something, right? So do we see an add character somewhere? Uh, it doesn't look like it. 
Well, we have a bunch of add characters. Uh, that is from other contexts. Yeah, it doesn't look like that. So, Wait for interrupt. We can see if, uh, oh, I have another suspicion. Hang on a second. Okay, so the trap handler is being registered for both hearts. So yeah, the branching only sorts here. So, it might be that we actually do end up in the trap handler, but we're not seeing any serial output because something else is also writing to the serial. And then we're just losing our output there. So we don't see that uh, single C. We also don't see anything from the trap handler. So what we could do uh, in the trap handler, we could also just call this function, right? I'm not sure if that is actually how it works or how it should work. Um, I think it should actually be just returning from the trap handler and then continue execution. Yeah, we can see. Uh, so we could we could just say main other hard is the trap handler. That could work. Could work. I don't know, we will have to see. So yeah. Um, and otherwise we can actually look in the vendor code again and uh, see what they're doing to uh, get the second heart to work. Yeah, let, let's actually try that now. Let's see if we can just use the uh, the second main function for the trap handler. Let's put it there and see what happens. It might also be that we need to reactively do something else. Like it could be that we actually need to handle something, do something in registers, uh, I don't know, maybe move on the program counter or something like that. I'm, I'm really not certain about this right now. Anyway, uh, we've already gotten very, very far, which is very good. And if we uh, recap again, so um, we uh, made this image at some point. Uh, then we were uh, coming up with a drawing of our migration plan. And let me just enlarge this again. So we're now here in this stage uh, where we have the uh, initial stage, including the DRAM in it, all written in Rust. And uh, ideally, we would actually like to move over here or even here directly. I think we can even skip this part where uh, you know you would, would be involved at all. Let's see what happens now. Let's see if Linux gets us something uh, for the second, well, it prints CPU, but what it really means is the hard and uh, in Rust five terms, cat proc CPU info. Well, that is still just one. Looks like bringing up something, bringing up secondary CPUs failed to come online. Oh well, I guess that is still spinning then. Huh. So 
So another thing we could do would be to comment out this call here, right? And then we can see if we get like lots of C's being printed. Could happen. Or maybe not. So yeah, if that doesn't happen, then yeah, and I will I will have to do a bit of uh, research again. Um, yeah, I guess we will just keep the stream very short today anyway. So yeah, we will start uh, next year fresh then and uh, see if we can get started with the uh, BL eight oh eight. Uh, so last time I checked, I saw the boards uh, that I should be getting are currently somewhere in Frankfurt, so not too far away from me. So they should now be arriving at any point in time. Okay, it looks like we're not seeing lots of C's being printed. So I'm very sure um, that the execution did not continue as expected. All right. So yeah, that means a bit of research time again. Um, I will always see how we need to properly handle this. So yeah, I guess we will have to look at the C implementation again. This year is uh, again the vendor code. Um, and well, that was just part of it actually. We can see if we can quickly dig that out, but I don't really think so to be honest. So we would need to look at the GDR init again. And here we have boot main.c and now let's just jump to the uh, part where it should release the other heart so that would be um, somewhere here uh, this year yeah you, you just need to read this in the other direction so it's writing this value to that register and that would then be releasing the heart and now what is happening uh, while waiting for it is uh, here it says wfi it's waiting for the interrupt it's actually the same thing that i'm also doing um, well and then that would actually jump to this down here Huh. Uh, no, we'll just continue here. So yeah, this is um, if the interrupt pending bit here is not set, uh, then it would just keep looping here. And otherwise, it should do this here. Uh, doing something with the clint and stuff is there another jump again yes down here down here it would just branch off to enter u-boot well and enter u-boot would just be uh, coming from down here where it's just loading the u-boot address so this year it would be including open sbi again and then it would continue executing there so this here is essentially the same that we're also doing in our boot already uh, with the function that we just created. Um. It's passing on some information, so I'm not even sure what BLTU would do. I could also Ah, it, it's definitely a branch instruction, branch something, branch of less than, I guess. Uh, what would A0 be? The heart ID. Uh, it looks really odd, to be honest. I, I'm not sure why they wrote it that way. No. 
I think they actually also have a trap handler somewhere uh, that would here. But that would be coming from somewhere else. Let's see if we have that also in the boot directory. Yes, it's in trap.c. Let's see what that is doing. Uh, blah de blah. Um, it prints trap. Okay. Handle trap. Cost and EPC. Yeah, that was really just some printing for debugging as it seems. And that would return again. And then this function would return again and would just continue. Okay, it looks like that isn't even necessary. So what whatever we're doing with the trap handler is like, I think completely uh, misleading, unnecessary. And let's revert it to this here. Mm. So here where it says wait for interrupt, wait for interrupt. It's the same as here, right? And it says it's, it's waiting for an IPI signal. So IPI is like, the signal for uh, continuing the boot process here. So MIP, I think it's machine interrupt pending and MSIP is like mm, some specific bit or something. So I, I guess this is a mask being applied to. So this here is the interrupt pending, uh, machine interrupt pending register. So it's reading that register to A2 and then it's applying a mask to A2 and then checks on the mask. So yeah, if that mask is actually clearing uh, the machine interrupt pending register, then it would jump to this year. Uh, no, that would continue, otherwise it would jump. Uh, so it would just keep spinning while whatever bit is not set that it's waiting for. So we, we could do essentially the very same as here uh, in our code. Um, but yeah, then again, any any interrupt should actually do. So can we, oh, we need to, do we need to trigger an interrupt? I thought that here uh, would actually be how we trigger the interrupt. So the, um, writing to this address, uh, the common up here actually needs removal. Uh, restore hard one from spinning, maybe. I don't know. We can phrase it in a different way at some point. So, yeah, but either way, this here should. This here should happen. So. Let's actually print something like pretty second hard. Like this. And we also make another new line. Let's print something funny so that we can see it very easily. So yeah, uh, just to make sure this is really correct. So Clint base adder is this year. It's 200 and quad zero, right? And we're saying uh, plus four. We could also write it that way, actually. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's the same as Clint control adder. So Clint control adder, where does that come from? That is coming from here. Oh, hang on. Huh. Here it's actually something different. 
It's actually this address. That is interesting. I guess I messed that up. So let's call it then control adder. I guess I copied the wrong thing somehow. Maybe I got confused by Clint. Uh, Clint, Clint, Clint. Clint. Const. Clint control adder. New class equals this. Oh. Oh. It is actually the same as Clint base adder. Oh, why did I have the plus four in here? I don't really know, to be honest. Oh, hang on. There is AC here. What is that too? AC. AC, XY. Good question. It's a bit strange. Anyway, um, let's let's actually try running this here now. Just make sure that it's uh, the right value that we're writing to it. So here they're loading clean control adder to S one. They're reading the heart ID to A0. So the heart ID should now be one. Okay. Now they're doing a shift left. They're shifting the one by two and that would give a four. Okay, so now we get the value four in here. And now this is four plus the clean control adder. So, okay, then I actually had the whole thing correct, except that we need to write a zero instead of a one. There we go, there we go. Okay, so we can keep the four and we need to write a zero. All right. Might be that that's actually it. No, we're not just translating C to Rust, but we're actually translating some assembly to Rust, um, which as you could see is also a bit adventurous. Yeah. There is a reason why we're not primarily programming things in assembly. I mean, it can be nice. There are some applications still for it where it's really sensible. Um, but yeah, in, in, in most cases, you don't actually really want to deal with that directly. It's just too error prone anyway. All right. DRAM test. DRAM test is sorting. Copy, auto boot something. It's actually so far, uh, so fast. It, Okay, here it says ready second heart. Um, so yeah, this year should actually be happening now. Call main other. Now we could have seen a C somewhere. We'll have to see. And we can see if now we got a second CPU somewhere in CPU info, cat prod CPU info, nope. Do we have something where it says bringing up, bringing up, bringing up, secondary CPUs? Nope, that still failed. Huh. All right, something is still messy. What a shame. Um, so we will uh, figure out 
one of the issue is here at some point, maybe next year, or maybe we'll get started with the Buffalo platform directly. Um, I will see a bit how far I can get with this year. So yeah. Um, what else? So yeah, next week, uh, again, I won't be here. I will be giving a talk at the um, Chaos Communication Congress online variant again. So that's like the remote thing that is going on. Uh, I will be talking a bit about Orboot and also about other things. Um, so yeah, go check that out. I hope we will have English translations. Otherwise, I will just repeat the talk at some other occasion again. And yeah, until then, uh, take care. Thank you very much again and goodbye.